Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. All right. So I'm going to give a very dense, information-packed talk tonight, but we're going to have time for more informal discussion after that. Um, so without further ado, let's jump right in. So as I'm sure many of you know, uh, evangelical Christians, particularly white evangelicals, were crucial to Trump's victory in the 2016 election. And polls have consistently shown that about 20% to about a third of registered voters identify as evangelical Christians. So it's a very large voting bloc, and they vote Republican very heavily, including in this election. Now, it's kind of paradoxical that evangelicals voted so heavily for Trump, for obvious reasons. And many evangelical leaders actually did speak out against him uh, during the primary. Some endorsed him, others, others didn't. James Dobson was uh, the founder of a group called Focus on the Family, which is one of the largest evangelical radio broadcast stations. And uh, in particular, he was a little reticent on Trump until he uh, heard a rumor that he recently accepted a relationship with Jesus Christ, shortly around the time he uh, launched his political campaign. <laughs> Uh, Jerry Falwell Jr., president of Liberty University, was uh, one evangelical figure. So Liberty University is the largest evangelical university in the world. It's located in a town called Lynchburg, Virginia. Uh, and uh, Jerry Falwell Jr. came out and endorsed Trump even before the Iowa primaries. And uh, has consistently supported Trump very heavily. This, in this particular instance, he was defending Trump after his comments on Charlottesville. Uh, more recently, televangelist Pat Robertson, uh, responding to the horrific shooting in Las Vegas, suggested that the shooting was God's punishment on America for its disrespect of Trump in the national anthem. So, this is a group that is crucial to Trump's victory and has shown almost completely uncritical support of his presidency so far. <clears throat> so it's kind of an abstract group to think about. So let's. Let me introduce you to some white evangelicals. So this is my family. Uh, I think I was about eight years old in that picture. I actually showed up wearing that tonight, but Jared told me to go change. Uh, both of my parents went to a college in Chicago called Moody Bible Institute that was founded by the evangelist Dwight L. Moody, mainly to train missionaries. Uh, my mom went on to become the director of a choir for a radio station called Children's Bible Hour, which is an internationally broadcast uh, radio station that focuses on children and the Bible, as you can guess from the name. Uh, my dad uh, is a family physician. Uh, he also wrote a scripture memory program for our church, which meant that from elementary school to high school, every week during the school year, I would have to sit down and memorize Bible verses and then recite them after Sunday school that Sunday. And then at the end of the year, I would have to recite the entire year's Bible verses from memory, uh, <laughs> for which I'd be rewarded with a gift certificate to a local Christian bookstore. <laughs> See, it seemed cool at the time, right? Um, uh, both my sisters sang in Children's Bible Hour. I, I sang in the program once, although wasn't invited to s back to this. <laughs> Reasons that I'm still not sure about. Um, but, you know, what's interesting to me is there's been a lot of talk about the white working class and factory closures, jobs moving overseas. It's really galvanizing support for Trump. But the, I mean, the, the people I know that supported Trump, especially the, the evangelicals uh, in Grand Rapids, Michigan, and other relatives in other places, are generally middle class, have stable jobs, uh, and didn't support Trump because of their entire economic circumstances. They voted for him because of their religious and moral beliefs. So we're going to talk about those. Uh, we're going to focus on those tonight. So in the evangelical community, a parent's highest aspiration for their child is not that he or she goes on to become rich or famous or goes to an Ivy League school. It's that their child retains their faith and passes it on to the next generation. And so keeping with that tradition, evangelicals tend to want to, their children to go to evangelical colleges, and there's a whole network of evangelical colleges throughout the country. Uh, I happen to go to a college called Calvin College, which is about 10 minutes down the road from where I grew up. Uh, happens to be the alma mater of Betsy DeVos. 
Uh, and I, you know, I went there, and my parents, what they paid for was to, you know, get me geared up and uh, solidified in the beliefs they had passed on to me. And I majored in biology, intending to go to medical school. And one of the things I found very interesting there, uh, moving through the biology major, is that the, the scholars at the school, the professors, had very strong disagreements with the lay evangelical community, uh, really on the whole range of issues that evangelicals are politically active on. So just to give you some examples, the bio biology professors all believed in evolution. The environmental studies professors all believed in climate change and that humans were the main contributors to it. The psychology professors, none of them believe that gay people choose to be gay or that they can be converted to heterosexuality. And they believe these things not because they had been liberalized by doing a PhD at some postal university. They believe them as a result of their faith. And I began to realize that there are very strong arguments, even from an evangelical Christian perspective, against the beliefs that animate evangelical political activism. And another thing I noticed is that professors were very hesitant publish books about these arguments or to talk about them publicly because the few times they had it would generate an enormous backlash from college donors, from parents, and from others outside the college community who tended not to hold these views. So it's very difficult for this gap in opinion to be exposed. And I, I realize this was not uh, only at Calvin College, but many evangelical colleges, this discrepancy exists. And so this is really fascinating to me. And so I took a brief detour before medical school to study this issue further from an academic perspective at Yale Divinity School. And ultimately, published a book about that. And my goal in this book, which was admittedly kind of arrogant and ballsy to publish a book at the age of 21, <laughs> but the reason I did it was not because I thought I was the most qualified person to write on these topics, but because I thought that I felt that the people who were most qualified were in a position where it was very difficult for them to write on these topics. Uh, because they were employed by evangelical organizations, evangelical colleges, evangelical seminaries. And as someone intending to go to medical school, who never intended to ever be employed by an evangelical institution, I had nothing to lose. Uh, and so, uh, so what, what I focus on in the book is attempting to synthesize and popularize a lot of the arguments that I learned that challenge popular evangelical beliefs, uh, particularly on political issues, from an evangelical Christian perspective. Now, one of the things I talk about in the book is that the way evangelicals think about abortion in, in particular, and this was published in 2011, is the way they think about it makes it almost inconceivable for them to vote for someone who is not for overturning Roe v. Wade. And the reason is because, in their minds, life begins at conception, abortion is murder. They're living in the midst of mass murder in their country, in their state, in their cities. And, you know, some evangelicals have, have come along that have had a more liberal perspective on many social issues, environment, uh, the poor, etc. But weighing any of those against mass murder in the minds of many evangelicals, it's, it's kind of no contest. And there's a certain logic to the position. And that can be a dangerous logic. It can justify overlooking a lot of very serious problems with a candidate. Uh, it can justify supporting the undermining of democratic norms. If you think you're voting for the guy who wants to end the Holocaust and his opponent wants to continue it, that can justify overlooking a lot. And this logic kind of played out among the evangelical leaders who were supporting Trump during the 2016 election. Franklin Graham, the son of the famous evangelist Billy Graham, noted that the election is really about the Supreme Court and the justices that the next president will nominate for evangelicals. So, part of, my, part of the argument I want to make here is that opposition to abortion, and the way evangelicals think about abortion, this is the heart and soul. This is the glue that holds together the religious right. Without this, I, I don't think all evangelicals would necessarily vote Democrat, but I think they would be much more widely dispersed. They would probably not have voted for Trump in nearly as great of numbers in this particular election. So it's, it's, if there's, and, 
And another thing I want to acknowledge is it is a little bit of an oversimplification to just talk about this one issue. But if there is one issue that you could change that would make the biggest impact, this is undoubtedly it. And so I want to focus on this issue tonight. Because what I learned uh, during my studies is that the evangelical thinking on this topic actually rests in a surprisingly flimsy foundation, even from an evangelical Christian perspective. And so this is going to be a little weird for you guys, because I'm going to walk you through these is this issue thinking about it from an evangelical Christian perspective. And in the process, I'm going to illustrate how I would talk to evangelicals and how I dialogue with them and attempt to convince them on these issues with some success. And so there are really three main things that have a big impact on how evangelicals think about political issues or other issues. First, the Bible. Uh, second, uh, traditional values and what past theologians have thought about topics. And third, believe it or not, science does occasionally have a role. And so we're going to focus on each of those tonight. So just starting off, the verse in the Bible that is most widely cited uh, by evangelicals as supporting their views on abortion is Psalm 139. And this is where uh, King David in the Old Testament is writing about how God formed him in his mother's womb, uh, how God had planned all of his days before any of them existed. And you can find similar themes in other verses. In Jeremiah, uh, God says to the prophet, Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. In Ephesians, the, the author writes that God chose us in him before the creation of the world. And, admittedly, not many scholars interpret this as teaching life begins at conception. Because what they're really talking about is that God had, has a plan for everyone's life. Uh, that God, you know, in the case of Ephesians, he talks about before the world even existed. In the case of Psalms, he talks about how God had a, had a plan for the psalmist days when none of them yet existed. So it's not really a statement that life be begins before the creation of the world or before the person existed. It just doesn't really make sense to think of these passages that way. They're really talking about God's foreknowledge, uh, God's plan for someone's future. Another passage that uh, is often quoted is in the New Testament in Luke. And it talks about Elizabeth, who is the mother of John the Baptist, who is a prophet that foretold the coming of Jesus in the New Testament. Uh, and she was pregnant at the time, and she heard Mary, the mother of Jesus, coming. And the text says that when she heard this, the child in her womb, who was John the Baptist, leaped, and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. And typically the argument here is that because the English translation uses the word child, that must mean that the fetus is a child uh, before birth. And part of the problem with this is it doesn't tell us which trimester she was in, so it certainly doesn't establish that it starts at conception. Uh, but even going beyond that, the, the Bible uses lots of words that we don't take to be making a literal assertion about the nature of the world. So for example, in Psalm Samuel 128, it says how the, the pillars of the earth are the Lord's, and on them he has set the world. Most evangelicals don't conclude from that that the world rests on pillars. Um, and the narrative function of uh, Luke 141 is reflecting how John will foretell the coming of Jesus, even before birth. Uh, when anti-abortion uh, activists are being really lazy, they just say, thou shalt not murder. Uh, but of course, the, the, the real debate is not whether murder is okay. It's whether taking the life of the embryo or fetus is murder. So this doesn't really get you that far. Uh, so the, the last passage, and the most specific passage in the Bible that is closest to giving information on when God or the Bible says life begins is in Exodus. And this is a set of laws that were given to the ancient Israelites. And it talks about a scenario when men are fighting and one injures a pregnant woman. It says that if he causes her to, to miss marriage, but doesn't cause any further injury, the one who does it shall be fined as the punishment. But if he injures the mother, the penalty is life for life. So this passage seems to set up different punishments for causing a miscarriage versus injuring the mother, suggesting a difference in the moral status of fetal life versus maternal life. And admittedly, there are some ambiguities, uh, there is some room for differences in interpretation that keep this from being a definitive statement on uh, what the Bible says about when life begins. But this verse has been interpreted by theologians throughout history, 
as a basis for elevating the life of the mother over that of the fetus. And so that's about it in terms of Bible verses relevant to the abortion debate. Uh, and, and, you know, many evangelicals will say, well, the broad themes in the Bible value human life, and that's true. Uh, but valuing human life highly doesn't necessarily mean you have to believe it begins at conception. That's kind of a different question than how you value what you already place in the category of human. And even many evangelical leaders and other leaders who strongly oppose abortion admit that the Bible doesn't really provide much fodder for that position. So Mark Galley, who's the editor-in-chief of Christianity Today, the largest evangelical magazine in the U.S., admitted, uh, actually in a debate with me, that the Old Testament does in fact seem to make a distinction in the life of a child versus the life of a fetus. Pope John Paul II, obviously very opposed to abortion, acknowledges the text of sacred scripture never addressed the question of deliberate abortion, and so do not directly and specifically condemn it. Richard Hayes, who is the former dean of Duke Divinity School, notes uh, in a book highly regarded by evangelical scholars that the Bible contains no text about abortion. So it's remarkable that an issue that has become so central to evangelical identity and politics has so little support in the Bible. And I want to contrast the lack of clarity on the topic of abortion with the presence of greater clarity on other topics in the Bible. So for example, on the topic of divorce in the Old Testament, God is quoted as saying, I hate divorce. In the New Testament, both Jesus and the Apostle Paul condemned divorce several times. The only possible exception made is for sexual immorality. And so, very clear prohibitions on, on divorce might lead you to believe, well, why aren't evangelicals trying to outlaw divorce? There's certainly more support in the Bible for doing that than there is for thinking that fetal personhood begins at conception. Uh, just one other issue that's very relevant to the campaign tonight is immigration and how you treat immigrants. In Leviticus, God gives the Israelites a set of commandments, and one of the commands he gives them is that when a stranger sojourns or travels with you in your land, you shall not do him wrong. You shall treat the stranger who sojourns with you as the native among you, and you shall love him as yourself, for you are strangers in the land of Egypt. So, in thinking about evangelicals and abortion, and their, the shape of their political activism, don't, let, don't ever let them get away with telling you they're just defending the Bible or they're just defending the Bible's values. The shape of the evangelical community's political activism shows that they're actually using the Bible to defend their own values. And when passages seem to conflict with those values, suddenly you discover a capacity for nuance and contextualization that doesn't seem to exist in other cases. So next I'm going to move on to the Christian tradition. And there are two features of the Christian tradition that have been fairly continuous. The first is that Christians have been morally opposed to abortion for most of their tradition. The second is that most Christian theologians have not believed life begins at conception. And I want to convince you by the end of the talk that evangelicals have abandoned both of those traditions. So evangelicals, as I mentioned, don't rely as heavily on tradition. Uh, particularly what earlier theologians thought about issues as Catholics do. So in that spirit, I'm going to gloss over a lot of the earlier church history. <laughs> but I want to show this quote from Thomas Aquinas, uh, because this, this specific view was the official view of the Catholic Church for most of its history. And his view is based on a doctrine called hylomorphism, which was that you couldn't put a human soul in any physical entity. So, for example, even God couldn't infuse a human soul into a turtle or an iPhone. There had to be a certain physical substrate present for that to be possible. And he articulates this doctrine, noting the rational soul ought to be united with the body, which may be a suitable organ of sensation. Before the body has organs in any way whatever, it cannot be receptive of the soul. Augustine shared this view. This view was articulated by many other saints and uh, leaders within the Christian community. Uh, it remained the official view of the Catholic Church until the 1800s. Skipping ahead to more recent history, and particularly evangelical history, 
In 1968, the Christian Medical Society and the magazine Christianity Today co-sponsored a gathering of evangelical Christian leaders from around the country to talk about abortion and contraception. And this was in a context where people were debating the nation's restrictive abortion laws at the time. And the stated purpose of the conference was to articulate the conservative or evangelical position within Protestantism. And the attendees produced a document that they signed, uh, noting that they didn't agree on whether an induced abortion is sinful, but they did agree that it was necessary and permissible under certain circumstances. Those circumstances included family welfare, social responsibility, and, when, and they concluded the document noting that when principles conflict, the preservation of fetal life may have to be abandoned to maintain full and secure family life. Around the same time, the magazine Christianity Today started, published a special issue devoted to contraception and abortion. And in the leading article, uh, Professor Ruth Watke from the famously conservative Dallas Theological Seminary kind of set forth the underlying biblical rationale for that statement. And he pointed to the Exodus passage that we mentioned earlier, writing that God does not regard the fetus as a soul, no matter how far its gestation has progressed. The law plainly exacts, if a man kills any human life, he will be put to death. According to Exodus 21, the destruction of the fetus is not a capital offense. Now, a popular myth within the religious right is that their movement emerged out of moral outrage, reacting to Roe v. Wade. But in reality, the response among evangelicals to Roe v. Wade was pretty mixed. Some magazines issued statements condemning the ruling, others issued statements praising it. And evangelical activists who were trying to rouse the community to action on a range of issues at the time complained that they were stubbornly apathetic on the issue of abortion. In contrast, immediately after Roe v. Wade, Catholics, who had adopted in the 1800s uh, the official position of the church that life begins at conception, for, for many other reasons other than the Bible, uh, formed the National Right to Life Committee. Uh, they began entering the political sphere and kind of established what it meant to be pro-life in the political sphere. <clears throat> so what led evangelicals to eventually join this movement? Well, in the mid-1970s, the, the IRS attempted to revoke the tax-exempt status of an evangelical Christian school that, in its perspective, was engaging in racial discrimination. The school is Bob Jones University, and the reason that they intervened was because it forbade interracial dating. And evangelicals had kind of formed their own subculture. They had their own colleges, their own magazines, their own radio stations and TV shows where it had been pretty content for most of the 20th century to coexist with secular culture unperturbed. And this, this was seen as an attack on religious freedom by the government. And this mobilized evangelicals to respond. And this is something that the co-founders of the religious right talk about. So Paul Weyrich, one of those co-founders, notes, what galvanized the Christian community was not abortion, school prayer, or the Equal Rights Amendment. I was trying to get those people interested in those issues, and I utterly failed. What changed their minds was Jimmy Carter's intervention against Christian schools, trying to deny them the tax-exempt status on the basis of so-called de facto segregation. Ed Dobson, who was an associate of Jerry Falwell, uh, we'll talk about next, uh, also happened to be the pastor of the church I grew up in, noted that the religious new right did not start because of concern about abortion. So what happened is that as evangelicals emerged from relative cultural isolation to political activism to challenge the IRS's uh, threat to what they perceived as their religious liberty, they began to encounter other consequences of the sexual revolution and other cultural changes that upset them and started to coalesce around, in particular, resisting the sexual revolution. And in the process, they formed common cause with Catholics, who had already established uh, with the National right, right to Life Committee what it meant to be pro-life in the political world. The only problem was that Catholics hadn't embraced that position because of the Bible. They had embraced it for a lot of other reasons, 
the Catholic Church tends to emphasize those reasons relatively more than the Bible compared to evangelicals. So what happened was that as evangelicals formed common cause with Catholics on these issues, they began reinterpreting the Bible as teaching the Catholic position on abortion. And one of the first instances of this phenomenon was in 1980. Uh, Jerry Falwell was the founder of the Moral Majority, probably the most influential organization in starting the religious right. And he notes in his book, Listen America, the Bible clearly states that life begins at conception. It is time that medical students, as well as every other person in our United States, put those words from the time of conception back into their thinking. So Jerry Falwell and many other evangelical leaders who were forming this new political coalition began disseminating this idea through, through flyers, radio broadcasts, television programs, uh, you know, trying to rouse lay evangelicals to action on this issue by convincing them that the Bible teaches that life begins at conception. And by the mid-1980s, they were so successful with this position that the popular evangelical community would no longer tolerate any alternative position. And one of the best evidences of that is a book called Brave New People that was published in the mid-1980s. And this was a professor living in New Zealand, who's an evangelical professor who kind of missed what was going on in the United States. And he articulated a position fairly similar to the position of most evangelicals only a decade earlier. And there was such an enormous reaction, so much outrage, to that book that the publisher that published it was forced to withdraw a book for the first time in its history. He did manage to get the book published a year later by another press, and he noted in a forward where he commented on this reaction, the heresy of which I appear to be guilty is that I cannot state categorically that human or personal life commences at day one of gestation. This, it seems, is being made a basic affirmation of evangelicalism, from which there can be no deviation. Despite that outrage, other evangelical scholars continue to write about these topics and articulate positions at odds with the popular evangelical community. Lou Smeads, who's at Fuller Theological Seminary, uh, Robert Weinberg at I believe this college is in California, it's an evangelical college. Uh, Ellen Verhe Hasselbaum at uh, Hope College and Calvin College all articulated positions at odds with the popular evangelical community. Now, I don't want to suggest that there were no evangelical scholars who supported the popular evangelical community's position. There certainly were. But they won the debate not because they convinced their academic peers, but because they had the wins of people like Jerry Falwell at their back. So to just summarize this history, the orthodox Christian position for most of History is that the soul is not present until a certain level of development is reached. The idea that the Bible says life begins at conception, which is foundational to the evangelicals' political activism and the pro-life movement they represent, was not widespread among Christians until the 1980s. And this new consensus was not established by a unanimous consensus among evangelical scholars. It was established and has been maintained through the suppression of dissenting evangelical scholarship. So, many scholars will acknowledge that you know, most past Christian theologians did hold the position that life begins at conception. You know, they lived a long time ago, and there have been new scientific developments that have occurred. And I do find it somewhat disingenuous when a community that doesn't believe in climate change or evolution claims the mantle of science to justify their position on abortion. But it's worth taking that argument seriously because there have been new scientific developments. In short, science, you know, science illustrates that the embryo is human life. It illustrates the process of pregnancy and makes it seem arbitrary to draw a line at any point during pregnancy and say, after this point, it's a child, but before that point, it's just a clump of cells. And I think that's fair. I think it's a fair point. I think there are a few problems in moving from those observations to the conclusion that science shows that life begins at the moment of conception. One of them is that 
science has also shown that life exists before conception. The sperm and the egg are also human life. Science also shows us that conception itself, like pregnancy, is a continuous spectrum of events. And just to get a little uh, medically geeky here, just to illustrate those events. So what happens is that the sperm membrane binds receptors on the egg membrane. Those membranes fuse. The sperm nucleus enters the egg cytoplasm. The egg then undergoes meiosis two to expel one set of chromosomes. Before that point, the entity has three sets of chromosomes and two nuclei, which by itself is incompatible with life. And then the egg nuclei and the sperm nuclei eventually find each other and fuse. At which point during this process does the moment of conception occur? Referring to conception as a moment obscures the fact that, like pregnancy, it's a continuous process. And it's hard to draw a cutoff line and say, magically, after this instant, something fundamentally different exists. Now, you can certainly say that the embryo is different from the sperm and the egg in some morally relevant sense, <clears throat> and that later in pregnancy is morally different from earlier in pregnancy. And the fact that you can't draw distinct lines anywhere in that process doesn't obviate the fact that something special does happen. It just means that we don't get around the question of drawing arbitrary lines by pointing at conception. It would be like saying life begins at the moment of pregnancy. <laughs> a, final, a final problem is that science doesn't tell us where to draw lines like that. That's determined by our own values. So another thing science has shown us that presents a problem for the idea that all embryos are morally equivalent to fully developed children is that about half of all embryos are spontaneously miscarried. And most of these occur before the woman even knows she's pregnant. It's thought to occur due to, due to a number of factors including chromosomal abnormalities, hormonal imbalances, and many factors that really aren't that well understood. And what's remarkable is that for a community that believes that these are all as morally valuable as you or I. There's been no attempt to raise the massive amounts of funding for research, for cures, for what would be the number one cause of human death. <laughs> so that shows a tension in their thinking. Just one other tension that I want to point to. During the primaries at a town hall, Trump was asked if he thought that women who get an abortion should be punished. And he was kind of new to this worldview and trying to think logically about how to answer that. And he said, of course, yes, there should be some form of punishment. All the mainstream pro-life organizations immediately condemned this statement by Trump, saying, of course, we do not support punishing women who have abortions. They often make these decisions in very hard circumstances. That's never been what we're about. Well, why not? If you think that having an abortion is equivalent to, say, a mother hiring a hitman to murder her five-year-old child, I think we would, most of us would agree she should be punished in those circumstances, regardless of how dire her situation is. So these are tensions that suggest that, you know, on some level, many evangelicals don't really act like they believe this is mass murder. Another argument is looking at ultrasounds. You, know, you see pictures of ultrasounds a lot at uh, anti-abortion rallies, and you can see something that looks pretty similar to a baby. This actually happens to be my son, by the way. Uh, <laughs> and uh, yeah, it's, it's disturbing to think about destroying that. And I think uh, one of the problems with this as an argument is that these pictures are almost always towards the end of the second or third trimesters, where Roe v. Wade allows states to ban abortions in circumstances, uh, except when the mother's life is at risk or there's some severe abnormality that would be incompatible with life outside the womb. The reality is that less than 1% of all abortions occur in these circumstances, and they're circumstances that are morally complicated where you're weighing the life of one individual against the life of another. 75% of abortions occur before this stage. This is at nine weeks of pregnancy. At this stage, the fetus uh, is just uh, losing its vestigial tail and gills. This is another picture that's more representative of when most abortions occur, where all you can really see is the yolk sac that's present. 
So I'm going to move to a broader perspective now and talk about public health research on abortion. Evangelical political activism on this issue has focused on <clears throat> trying to make abortion illegal by overturning Roe v. Wade. And there's been a, a fair amount of research done by physicians and other uh, medical researchers on the public health consequences of that, as well as the uh, correlates of abortion rates. And this is a paper that was published in the journal The Lancet last year, which is a major medical journal, that looked at the relationship between abortion laws and the abortion rate across different countries. And so what you can see here in different categories are different categories of laws. So for example, at the top, you have 58 countries they looked at that prohibit abortion altogether except to save the life of, uh, of the mother. And you can see in those countries, the abortion rate is 37 out of 1,000 reproductive age women. And you can go down the list and look at the other categories of laws and look at the corresponding abortion rate. If they allow abortion for physical health, it's 34, or I'm sorry, it's 43 out of 1,000. For a woman's mental health, it's 33 out of 1,000. Down to the bottom, if they allow abortion on request, it's 34 out of 1,000. And what you can see here is that there's not an obvious relationship between the type of laws countries have and what their abortion rate is. In fact, in this particular study, although I'm sure it's not statistically significant, the abortion rate is lower in countries that have more permissive abortion laws than in countries with more restrictive abortion laws. And this is an observation that's been made previously. This is a study looking at the percentage of reproductive age women living under permissive abortion laws and correlating that with the abortion rate. And in this particular study, they found that the higher the percentage of reproductive age women living under permissive abortion laws, the lower the abortion rate. Now, correlation doesn't prove causation, and you can't really conclude from this that permissive abortion laws cause the abortion rate to be lower. But they do suggest there's no obvious relationship between making abortion illegal and reducing the number of abortions. Now there are more obvious relationships about other policies. One of those policies is the Mexico City policy. This was a policy that was first instituted under the Reagan administration. And what it does is bar the federal government from giving money to any family planning organization that includes abortion as part of its services. <clears throat> and what's interesting about this from a public health perspective is that you can observe the consequences before and after this policy is instituted. Because what happens is, whenever a Republican president has been elected since then, the policy is instituted. When a Democratic president is elected, the policy is revoked. This particular study was done by a professor at Stanford Medical School. And he looked at the abortion rate in 20 countries in sub-Saharan Africa that received funding from the U.S. government for family planning clinics. And the vertical dotted line in the middle represents when the Mexico City policy was reinstated by the Bush administration. And you can see here that after that policy was reinstated, the abortion rate rose in those countries. And this was a statistically significant rise, uh, increase in the abortion rate. So these are the policies, this is a policy that evangelicals strongly support. And based on this study, we can see that it raises the abortion rate. Uh, another study that was done at Washington University in St. Louis School of Medicine. This was an interesting study where they recruited about 10,000 women from the St. Louis area and provided them with free, long-acting contraception. And they followed them for several years and measured the abortion rate in these women compared to the abortion rate in the surrounding St. Louis area. And what they found was that the women in their group that had been provided free contraception had an abortion rate that was about 75% lower than the abortion rate of women in the surrounding area. And based on that, they were able to calculate or estimate the number of abortions that intervention prevented, seeing that it was several thousand per year in this case, in just one city. Of course, some of you may have heard the news today that the Trump administration is making it more difficult for women to get access to family planning. And this is something the evangelical community and the religious right strongly support. <clears throat> 
So it makes you wonder who's actually against abortion. It doesn't really matter what you call yourself. It matters what the effect of the policies you support actually are. And unfortunately, the debate in the country has been framed as the religious right opposes abortion and progressives support it. But the reality is that the religious right supports policies that have been shown to increase the number of abortions, and progressive support policies that have been shown to decrease the number of abortions. So I just want to talk a little bit about the future. You know, many of us are sad and depressed right now. Uh, one of the, there was an interesting poll that came out two years ago uh, looking at religious affiliations in America. And one of their findings was that people across, Americans, uh, millennials I should say, across all major branches of Christianity in America were leaving the Christian faith of all branches in pretty unprecedented numbers. And one of the reasons that they discerned for this from interviews with millennials and young people one of the reasons that they were leaving and citing was the uncritical alliance between Christianity and the Republican Party. In particular, a lot of uh, younger evangelicals commented on the evangelical community's policies that harmed gay people. Even within the subgroup that stayed within the evangelical Christian community, there was a large shift among millennials to more progressive views on several issues, including gay marriage, immigration, and environmentalism. Now I should say that one area where millennials' views hasn't shifted substantially is on abortion. Millennials generally oppose abortion at similar rates as the older generation. And that's one of the reasons why I think it's so important for progressives to reframe this debate. <laughs> So, the thing is, the, all, these, all these changes and trends and demographics were well before Trump was elected. The presence of Trump in the White House with nearly uncritical support from evangelicals for four years is going to dramatically accelerate these trends. That's my prediction, at least. And I think people in my generation are going to associate this, this guy with the religious right, with evangelical political activism for our entire generation, for our whole lives. We're going to remember how our parents abandoned values that they had taught us, accepted putting lives of minorities and fundamental norms of our democracy in jeopardy, and decided that pursuing poorly thought through ends on abortion justified achieving power through any means. And so what do you guys do about it? Well, I think one common misperception is that evangelicals believe the way they do because they're not that bright. Uh, and I think that's not really true. You know, I've lived in deep in middle America as well as on the coast. I think the levels of intelligence are similar. I think the reason that evangelicals believe the way they do is because on a personal level, most evangelicals have never had these arguments and the evidence explained to them in a manner that's not condescending, that's not threatening, that's friendly. And I think it can be very effective when having conversations with evangelicals to try to get past any anger that you may have about the fact of their policies and really just hone in on the arguments. <clears throat> Another factor that I would recommend, uh, based partly on the demographic trends I talked about, is to focus on young people. No offense, but uh, older people, <laughs> you know, tend to be more established in their views, and the evangelical community is no ex exception. Uh, young people, especially in the evangelical community, are already reconsidering positions on these issues. And the presence of Trump in the White House creates a very conducive environment to accelerate that process. And the final request I would have is to share this presentation. So we're, gonna, we're actually recording this whole presentation. We're going to make it available online. We want to get it to reach as far as we can. And I think it's going to be posted on the Indivisible Healthsburg Facebook page. Um, so with that, thanks so much for having me.